So, uh, as is often the case in the evenings at the uh, Cambridge Graduate Institute, uh, but I think more so than usual, we have assembled an extraordinary uh, uh, panel of uh, speakers and uh, sharers tonight. And uh, I think we have Joe mostly to thank for this. And as usual. Yeah. Uh, on my far right is uh, Ron Cher. Uh, the uh, original Life is Good windsurfing man, <laughs> who uh, uh, he, he said to me uh, uh, today as uh, we were uh, just getting together, he said, you know, anyone who lives the life we lead, who uh, claims that life is not good, ought to have their head examined. <laughs> Self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. Thank you, Ron. I, was, I knew I would get it wrong. But anyway, uh, early in his career, he was at first a, a shopping center developer. Uh, this seems to be a career which leads people to interesting places. And then he became a redeveloper, and then he became a placemaker who uh, was interested in taking places that were uh, not headed towards uh, glory and turning them around uh, so that they became wonderful places of community. And he's now a community builder. He's uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Crossroads Shopping Center in Bellevue is his. Uh, third place books, and the whole idea of third place, that every community needs a third place where people can go to get together, is uh, Ron is a great exponent of, uh, of that whole uh, concept. He owns Elliott Bay uh, Bookstore uh, because he was going out of business and something had to be done, uh, and he's done it. And now he's uh, more and more interested in the project for public spaces, which uh, is carrying on this whole third place uh, tradition of uh, how do we build community which is sort of at the basis of uh, democracy and all the other things that we care about. Uh, Cindy Franklin uh, points out that she is uh, a volunteer in the thing that she's going to talk about tonight, that she's really an organizational development consultant, uh, but that her passion uh, does include a nonprofit called Resources, which does uh, educational advocacy in, in the area of reusing things, uh, recycling, waste issues, and so forth. And this uh, organization has uh, been incredibly clever in that it has formed a for-profit subsidiary uh, which uh, funnels money into the educational advocacy efforts. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that. This is uh, uh, called the Restore. And they uh, uh, tear down buildings and, uh, and uh, put the parts up for sale. They also acquire the parts of buildings, building materials in other ways. And they do three million pounds a year of, uh, of, of building materials in the stores in Bellingham and also in Ballard. Uh, and they are just entering into uh, the computer recycle business, which uh, my, uh, my advice to you is lots of luck on that one. Uh, but, Not a money-making venture, for sure. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Tim Taylor, local uh, Bainbridge uh, resident, uh, uh, began his life in uh, one of those people who just cannot hold a job or even a company. Uh, and, uh, he, uh, he went through a, a series of companies in his youth in, in businesses uh, that did include things like publishing, but uh, uh, actually were mostly in the design and construction business. And he specialized in homes which or buildings which were built between 1700 and 1760, the restoration thereof. And he was happily doing this uh, when uh, the Laird Norton Company uh, uh, tapped him for a, a vice presidential job. Laird Norton is a, a big... Uh, uh, family-owned company, 149 years old. Uh, when Weyerhaeuser decided to come out of this area, they financed Weyerhaeuser. Uh, they own Lumbermans and a whole bunch of other uh, building materials uh, distribution companies and financial services and resorts and all sorts of things. And he ended up as CEO of Laird Norton. And uh, then uh, in 2000, he retired from that job and casting about for something to do uh, and not uh, a glutton for punishment. He uh, <laughs> He took over the Environmental Home Center, or took over a CEO of the Environmental Home Center, which uh, supplies all kinds of highly envir environmental building materials and is really cool and has got uh, uh, something, is it 55% uh, of their businesses and new customers, but their uh, old customers are growing 67%, uh, they're, they're the size of the old customer business is growing 67%, sort of like BGI, this sort of explosive, uncontrolled growth, uh, God help us sort of thing, uh, uh, at the rate at which things are going on anyway, Tim. That, uh, and that uh, he also drives too fast. And then that, uh, <laughs> it's up to them in a small <laughs> Not on Bainbridge. No, nobody drives too fast on Bainbridge. That doesn't work. Not on I-5 either. He drives too fast on the track. I should, uh, I should point out. Uh, the, uh, 
David LaHaye uh, is the sole proprietor uh, of a company called Evergreen, which is an engineering consulting firm. And they work for all kinds of cool companies in, in a great variety of industries. You know, the semiconductor industry, they have half the players I've ever heard of in the semiconductor industry. Uh, uh, work for Toyota, Boeing, Kimberly Clark, Seagate, uh, Samsung, well, and, uh, and they do pulp and paper, cement, steel, refineries, and so forth. And what they're in is basically the industrial ecology business. They find the byproducts that people are making, and they figure out what those who do, uh, who would like to buy those and use them for something, and, and hook the uh, whole system together so that waste equals food. And I think you all know quite a lot about uh, why that's a good idea, so I won't say too much more about it. And uh, so you got to admit, kind of an interesting panel, and to think that we only have 90 minutes, it doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, anyway. Uh, what we're going to do is give them each 10 minutes, and I should set my watch for that, uh, but I'll let Ron start off talking while I do that, which will give you an extra 30 seconds. I was hoping that by sitting at this end I wouldn't be first. But <laughs> would you write, you think would be no, first? no, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I, as I say, I've been in the shopping center business. I've always been passionate about the, uh, the environment. I, uh, got, uh, I've been a life member since of 65, and they must figure I'm ready to croak, so everybody wants to come and see me about my will. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, I, so I've, I've cared a lot about these issues for a long time, and, and I ended up getting into the first one to work as an environmentalist, but realized that, uh, you know, I, it, it was better to build an economic base first. And I was been in the shopping center business for quite a while, and redeveloping a shopping center in Bellevue, which is about a 40-acre center that we have there. Uh, I uh, was realizing that it was in the middle of a neighborhood, and we had to find some way to get a comparative advantage to make it successful. And going through this process, we realized that we had all the urban energy in the downtown, we had diversity. What we didn't have is the standard thing. We weren't by a freeway. We couldn't compete for the fashion shopping trip, whatever. But what we could be is a great downtown, great community place. And uh, we ended up uh, developing uh, the interior of it that has free music, uh, has, has 20 restaurants seating for over a thousand, uh, has a mini city hall, a library, a police station. Uh, puppet theaters, chess sets, uh, you know, on and on. And, uh, but I realized in doing this, all of a sudden it changed the entire nature of the community. And the community became much more vital, the houses become, became more uh, valuable, the property tax base came up, people had a place to gather, you sent messages by a giant chess set to come and be here. It wasn't just shopping as usual, it was, you know, uh, we welcomed the used bookstore, we put it at the front door, we brought in the library. It was more like, how do we get people thinking and interacting and create this real strong force for democracy? So, in the midst of this, I came across this guy, Ray Oldenburg, and Ray wrote a book called The Great Good Place, and he had this idea. Uh, he was the first one to formulate what they call the third place theory, and that's in, the, in people's lives. In most societies, there are three places. One is home and family. One is everybody you know through your work. That's number two. Is, and the third one, in most societies, there's a third place. And this is where you encounter the community. And because you do, and you have this outlet, you have this way to see things from an entirely different perspective. You don't have the isolation that comes with the community and in your own car to your yard and seeing everybody over the internet. You know, now we're locked into a homes because of air conditioning, nobody's on the porch. So you've got to have ways to set this loose so that people can interact. And in a private environment, we can stress also some things that are really my buzz points, which are safety and civility, that people treat each other with respect. And we don't tolerate incivility. And so otherwise you don't have a place where people can get together. So seeing the huge impact this made, I thought, can I create a model that works so that we can revitalize neighborhoods that are destroyed by Walmarts or other downtowns that haven't worked over time. And when I redeveloped Crossroads, the toughest thing was getting critical mass. At first you get in, you're trying to get all this started, and you've got one or two or three businesses, and they all die because there's not critical mass, which brings it all together. So in my first third place I developed, it's 44,000 feet with four restaurants, 
uh, seating for 600, a stage, a demonstration kitchen, a bakery cafe, a college that has 8,000 square feet, and a 14,000 foot bookstore with lots of author events. And this was a critical mass that basically began to turn around that neighborhood. We even had, they could tell it wasn't very profitable, the, the, the neighbors, so they, it's amazing the intentionality with which they shopped and supported it. In fact, they even came together and formed a 501c3, a, a nonprofit called Friends of Third Place Commons. And all the members of the, and over 500 members of the community and corporate members who actually contribute and support a staff and run community events in this commons that we have dedicated to them, which also is the commons for the college, the seating for the restaurant, the place for the book events, and it has become the nerve center of the community. I did a smaller one where I bought the Old Pacific Consumer Co-op in Ravenna and turned this into a bakery cafe, a new and used bookstore, we're doing a non-smoking pub, and we're also doing this whole thing as a holistic gathering place along with the patio and the architecture a la Hundredwasser, if you know the Austrian architect, to, to make the entire building sort of an artwork that's around community gathering. And in the process of this, Elliott Bay was going out of business and I was in starting a book business, so I took on <coughs> Elliott Bay and now I have a good manager running it. There's probably ten minutes. That's enough. Yeah. You have more, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you more uh, in, in questions. Oh, okay. So. So what, uh, uh, what was the biggest mistake that you made while uh, doing this? Trying to raise any capital when, in the time period when everybody was looking at 30% IRRs because the world was going nuts. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and hiring a few of the wrong people and, and uh, uh, some of my expectations. Uh, and my biggest success is that we're still in business. We celebrated our sixth anniversary, <laughs> and we, we and, and in non-financial terms, we're amazingly <laughs> successful. In non-financial terms. <laughs> I moved into the Ravenna neighborhood just this winter, and the third place bookstore was one of my first places where I, I knew to go. Like, just became aware of that. It's like, wow, I have to go here. So I went almost every night. Great. <laughs> 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 We have free internet access everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would sit there for an hour before I bought a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we, we at first put, put really big tables in so everybody would get to know everybody else, and that's fabulous up at Lake Forest Park. In Ravenna, the college students take them all over and don't spend any money. So we're taking the big tables out, putting lots of little tables in, so that at least if they're going to spread out, they spread out on a little table, and they don't take a table for six people or eight people. <laughs> Social engineering. There's a lot of that. I saw an article, I think it was maybe in the Puget Sound Business Journal or something, about your work in the Bellevue Mall. And it's just neat to have you here. I just wanted to say that because I was really inspired by what you're doing. I think it's really neat. And it seems like it's such a no brainer to create a place like that that I don't understand why the other malls don't get the clue. Well, you know they're beginning to, and that's one of the things I want to talk about later is the, is the work and what I see is the future and the way the world is going and how we want to impact it a little bit about placemaking, which is what I, I think of the, the, the next third of my career is going to be. <laughs> but there was a spread in the Pacific Northwest, right? yes. also, which also ties into it so for the Sunday paper magazine, and what, what I loved about that was the fact that they were highlighting and touching on these issues as important to everybody, to spread out the importance of this. I was lucky to have that one. He, he was very generous. More questions? Nathan, you want him to talk a little bit about the, the next third of his life? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, the next third of my career. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get it wrong. No, no, I, I, I guess I'm just too You're picky. Yeah. I'm too picky. Uh, we think, uh, as I go around and I talk about what I do and I meet people, and some of the people that I've met, a uh, great group of people are uh, the people at Project for Public Spaces back in New York City, which is probably the foremost organization in the world about placemaking. They've been in New York for 30 years, and they 
uh, consult all over the world and run conferences and public markets and everything else. And uh, it's an amazing group of people and I was fortunate enough to be invited to be on their board and I'm working with them. And one of the things that we're seeing is that everybody is becoming more and more interested in place. And that place really ties in almost as a de common denominator to most things that, that's going on as far as neighborhoods and democracy and sustainability and transportation and recycling and wise land use and protecting the environment. <coughs> How do you protect the urban growth boundaries and everything else unless you're going to have livable cities where people really want to come in and more public goods where you, everybody shares parks and shares things rather than private goods where everybody has their own lawn and lawnmower. And how do you, you, know, you create this richness for the steady state economy, if you go all the way back to John Stuart Mill, about how do you create more and more public goods and livable communities. So, so everybody is getting more into this. So what we're also seeing is that uh, as society becomes more footloose, you can operate anywhere as you want on a computer, you can live wherever you want. You have all these assets in the community, you don't want to sprawl throughout the world. You have to, as a society and as a city, you have to make your cities great. That's why you look at the Richard Florida, the cultural creators talk about how everybody has gone to Austin and Seattle and New York. Well, what, what is the new form of capital in the, in the next century? Well, a lot of it's going to be something we're postulating as place capital. It's either, generally people talk about, you know, land, labor, and capital, then they talk about social capital, the two kinds. They talk about bonding social capital, which is the kind you, you all run into where, where everybody preaches to the choir about things or everybody goes to the country club and they bond. But then there's another kind of social capital, which is bridging social capital. And that's where you get in an environment where you can create the social capital, but it's the diversity, it's the age diversity, the racial, the ethnic diversity, the kinds of things that you can get through a third place. And one of the reasons that we've done our, our third places around bookstores is because we want to get people thinking and thinking more. Right now they're talking about literature, how uh, people are reading less and there are more books published and there are some people that just don't read, they play video games and watch television. Well, we're trying to get people to start thinking at the same time. So we're working on place, and so we're postulating that there's going to be a new form of place capital. And as that becomes more and more realized, and we talk about public-private partnerships and how we capture these external, the people, these external benefits that place, capture, place creates, we need to capture and get those people to invest in place so place can become better and better, and as people realize that there will be more uh, invested capital from property owners, from citizens, from the public, and there will be investments like are done by this nonprofit group, Friends of Third Place Commons, who go and they volunteer and they work in their community <coughs> to run political forums and, uh, and art for seniors and free tutoring for kids, and even they even have games of magic that the adults are for. So. And, it, and all the parents love it because at least they know where their kids are hanging out because they're all in third place playing magic, you know, even though it's not maybe our favorite activity. But so we want to bring all these early adop adapters around and discuss it and create a placemaking movement. And that's what PPS, maybe along with ULI and uh, all these groups are, that's what I want to do for a while. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Mm. It's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I, uh, I actually have a background in business. I started out in the computer field and um, had a passion for helping the environment in some way ever since I was in college. This has gone back a long time. Um, and I always felt that what I was doing in business was somehow contributing to the destruction of the planet. So I, you know, it was always a conflict inside of me. So um, my purpose in when I turned 40, I said I'm doing a major career change. I went back to get my master's degree at Leos actually and um, my focus was to go back into corporations and somehow work with them to make change, make change in the world. Um, 
So I have been an organization development consultant, and I found that the businesses that were most <coughs> um, in, you know, attracted to me as that particular type of consultant, because I knew that that was my love, were nonprofit organizations, which typically could not afford to pay me very much. So I ended up doing a lot of volunteer work, um, and one of the organizations was Resources um, up in Bellingham, uh, an environmental organization that I contracted to do a board retreat with them. I fell in love with the people, fell in love with the organization, and about a year later was called to be on the board. So I've been on their board two years now. Um, the mission of, the non, of this nonprofit organization called Resources, our mission is environmental education and advocacy. And um, we're all very focused on our, our big mission is to try to change individual behavior and to become aware of each of our um, impacts that we have on our community and, and on the earth. We, um, we have, where I brought my, my cheat sheet here, I believe we have about seven different programs. Um, when the organization first started, it was only recycling. This was 21 years ago. And it, it kept evolving. Um, they would get grants. We had this incredible staff, just very opportunistic. Um, the ReStore, I'm just jumping all around because there's so much to say. Um, the ReStore. Um, yes, the ReStore. <laughs> um, was started um, initially about 11 years ago. Uh, the organization realized that they were really into recycling and waste reduction and one of the most obnoxious um, use, you know, misuse of our natural resources were just usable building materials just being thrown into the dump. So some forward-thinking people um, requested, this is, where, this is where when we now talk about sustainable business, we're in kind of that fuzzy area because we started the ReStore with a $30,000 grant from the city. Um, and we opened up the initial store and we started just accepting stuff that people would drop off and then would be resold. Um, it has now grown, five years ago we opened a second store which is in Ballard and we now recycle and resell three million pounds of building materials a year. The model is um, that we use is the store's purpose is obviously to achieve our mission, which is waste reduction, um, which is part of our mission. Um, ideally, we would generate funding to sustain our programs, our education programs, the advocacy work we do. Um, we have a program called the Baykeeper Program. Bellingham Bay, as many of you might know, is terribly polluted due to um, pulp mills that were in the area f until recently, spewing out you know tons of mercury around into the bay. Um, the Baykeeper Program um, is funded by grant money, and over the last few years, we've seen a lot of our grants and contract diminish, so we're really now relying on the stores to make money. Um, we, none, of the, none of the board members were all volunteer. The, the executive director, no, no one had business experience. Um, Well-meaning people who just wanted to save junk and resell it, and they knew it was in their heart to do this. Um, we're learning now by trial and error continuously. We, have we know there is such a demand out there. We just have a sense there, um, there is so much more we can tap into. The Seattle store in five years, it's just starting to just take off. We can hardly keep the material in there. Um, a few years ago, we started a field operation where we contract with um, major construction companies to do deconstruction work. So we send out crews of people to a job site to manually take apart buildings and we reuse the materials. Initially, this part of the business was not bringing money. In fact, we were losing money because 
they were so, the staff people were just so excited to go out there and save the stuff that they were not thinking in terms of a business. Okay, what is reusable? We were spending a lot of money just disposing of this stuff. Um, so we had to get more savvy about the kinds of contracts that we would take on. How much time do I have left? For, <laughs> Four minutes. Um, so um, there are a lot of um, you know, opportunities in that area that we, we're just starting to tap into. Um, so I would say that our biggest challenge, um, and I've been on the board, as I said, for two years, but we're struggling with staff issues and, um, and, and developing our store managers and our staff to the, be able to grow and to take advantage of new opportunities and to really start thinking in terms of a business um, of ways that we can really continue our mission. Yes, our mission is to recycle building materials. However, let's take a look at how we can really start making some money doing this. We really do pretty much break even. Um, we're kind of erratic throughout the year, which is really interesting. We're just starting to track um, where we are with cycles for season seasonal sales. Um, we don't really have, we're just starting to develop some technology that we can use to start um, doing inventory control. Um, it's been pretty much loads of huge, you know, material shows up at the store, you know, the field crew turns it over to the salespeople, okay, go sell it. There's really was no system for pricing. It was um, whoever knew someone, they'd call on their cell phone, hey, you better get over there quick. Some stuff is on its way to the store. So it was who you knew. If you knew the right people, you show up and you get all the cool stuff. Well, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, if I'm the ultimate business manager for this operation, wait a minute, why don't we have an auction or something? I mean, some of this old material is incredible. Doors, windows, you know, huge old growth timbers. And um, so, so we actually are playing around with eBay a little bit. We get, um, in some of the deconstruction jobs of houses, we get whatever's left around in the attic. And sometimes they're incredible antiques. And, you know, the guys go in there and pick up the box and bring it to the store. And they look in there, yeah, this looks pretty cool. We'll sell this for five bucks, two dollars, three dollars. And uh, one of the fellows was just happened to be in the store and said, wait a minute, these are old um, state of, you know, some university pennants from like the 1940s or something. These might be worth something. Let's put it on eBay. One of the guys was going to sell it for just four bucks just to get rid of them. There were about ten of them. And we got $250 for one and, you know, so much for another. So we're just starting to play with really running this like a business. I guess that's what I want to say for now about it. Excellent. What, uh, uh, what's special about being a business whose purpose is to provide money to a nonprofit? Does that change anything? Does it change the way you relate to employees or the way you need to do business? Is there anything, any lessons in there? For, I mean, there's others here who are actually interested in, in that model, and I'm just wondering. We're still very much focused on the mission, and I would say that, that the staff people are so focused on the mission, they forget about the profits. So um, we, we all need to hold the mission and remember profit. Somehow that's, um, you know, that they're both important. And not just have a non-profit mentality so much. It's a different way of thinking. And is that culture evolving over time? Very slowly. Mm -hmm. Very slowly. <laughs> Would you, if you had to do it over again, have hired somebody who, uh, say, was a graduate of Bainbridge graduate? <laughs> <laughs> no, we are in. Or current student. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, since I've been on the board, I have really pushed our executive director, who grew with the organization. He helped start the first store 14 years ago. He is not a business person. Mm -hmm. He is hard. He he would stand in the dump and pull out the wood, you know, and you know, and salvage it if he could. Um, I've been pushing him and pushing him. He actually has um, a position that he had for a retail store manager. This was a huge cultural. Um, success for us to actually say we need a business 
manager. We need someone, maybe an MBA, maybe not, but someone who can come in here and run these stores and really run them properly. So then everyone, so we've been going back and forth. Oh, but they have to be an environmentalist. They can't just be a business. You know, they can't just want to make money. So ultimately, they have to be an environmentalist. Uh, they have to have that passion in their heart, um, you know, before they can talk about the bottom line. So it's, the culture is slowly moving into that area. But we have a huge hiring process. We just, our executive director stopped da uh, stepped down and we offered the position just today to a new person mm -hmm. who has um, a business background as well as um, an environmental background. Mm -hmm. So we are starting in that direction. Excellent. Yes. So which is better? A social venture that is a for-profit organization that gives its money to a good cause? or a non-profit that tries to figure out business in order to fund itself? I would say whichever is the most effective. I, I don't think one's better than the other. You know? So which is more effective? I think, yeah, I think effectiveness is the key. Who's, you know, which model is working and doing the best for the planet or for the people or, you know, the community. So would your experience lead you to one conclusion or the other? Um, I would... I would prefer to be in a, in a for-profit company that made lots and lots of money and did good and gave money away. Just um, and, and that's what intrigues me about what's happening here at BGI because um, I think that then it's, it's, a, it's a model that other corporations and maybe multinational corporations could see that works and, and there's viability in it. So. That'd be my preference, personally. Were there, were there, are there complications, other than cultural, uh, legal complications, uh, uh, any constraints on the way you run the business that come from being owned by a nonprofit that uh, you think are inherent in the model? Well, from what I know, and I, I'm not an IRS, you know, um, expert about the details of that, but. Um, if we were to venture into selling new, um, you know, cabinetry, perhaps more what you're doing at the Environmental Home Center, um, it, it, it kind of strays a bit away from our mission, per se. So that would be a gray area. We may have, for example, we've talked about that. We have 30,000 square feet at our Bellingham store. We, we have a cheap lease on it. We've toyed with the idea of subleasing space out and actually, you know, to another company that could then sell new materials there. New, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know, you know, from the tax perspective, yeah, Rick's probably been talking. I hate when business gets run by the old boy network. <laughs> <laughs> old girls do. <laughs> um, so, they're, they're pro I, I believe as long as we work within the confines, I guess, of our mission, we can't venture off and start selling, um, you know, other other products. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. that's what I understand mm -hmm. about the IRS ramifications of it. And someone else may know more about that than I do. I'd actually like to hear about the computer recycling. Well, we started that. Um, we were very concerned when we had heard that. Um, <coughs> No one knew where our computers were really going. I mean, I guess unless they went back to the manufacturers. So locally, we started doing that in the store. And we, um, the board made a decision that we would do it as a break even. We were not trying to make money, and we hoped not to lose money. So we played around with what would it cost for the, um, the staffing for that little piece of, of that mission, that program. And what would we have to charge people? We do have to charge. So we decided that um, the company that we use who actually, um, they, they have a certification, and I can't actually tell you where it goes, but I, I, I know that it's um, done in a responsible way where they, um, I don't know where they take it. Um, we have to charge from anywhere between about 15 and $50 to someone who brings in a, an old computer We've lost, in six months, we've lost $1,400. Yeah. 
And I know it's because what happens is the staff people get hold of this stuff and they try to do more. They try to use the component. They don't just throw it in the truck because they'll say, wait a minute, this still works, this <laughs> monitor. Okay, we're, so I went into what our meeting room, where our meeting room is supposed to be, and it was all this all used stuff was everywhere. And people were plugging things in and trying to make it work. But we're probably, you know, people are probably doing this volunteer too. I mean, these people, they don't want to have something that works go in the dump. So that's, we've been doing it only for 